Welcome to L4J, and uh, it's just a thrill for me to record lessons and know that you're going to be listening to them. And I'll be seeing a lot of you and as the week goes by and we get out in our visitation, Dakota and I. And um, so that's always a blessing to me. And just knowing that you are listening, you're participating in the study, is a blessing as well. So thank you so much for joining us. Today's lesson is entitled, Let the Peace of God Rule in Your Hearts. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. If you'll join me, please. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for who you are and for the way you love us. Lord, thank you for forgiving us of our sins and paying the price, the high price, for the sins that we committed and loving us so much that you allow us to choose to invite you into our heart. Thank you so much for salvation that you provide. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for each person who has chosen to join with me in this study. Lord, as we study, we rely upon the Holy Spirit as our teacher. Pray, Lord, that our minds and hearts would be open to receive what he has for us today. Lord, we have so many people who have lost loved ones. We've lost dear friends and partners. And Lord, uh, we just pray that you would continue to speak the peace to their hearts, Lord, and to strengthen them and give them wisdom and endurance. And Heavenly Father, help us to be faithful, to lift them up in prayer and to visit and to do whatever you would have each one of us to do to minister to the needs of each other. And I thank you for that. I pray for those who are sick with the virus and various other ailments. I know, Lord, that you're the great physician and it's a wonderful pleasure that we have to be able to turn to you in time of need and lift up illnesses to you, knowing that it's not an exercise in futility, but knowing that you are able Lord, we thank you for the miraculous healings that we have seen. And Lord, we know all that's your doing and it's in your hands. We don't dictate to you, Lord, but we are so thankful for the way you've met so many needs and have answered so many prayers. We're grateful to you. I pray, Lord, that you would just lead and guide us in this study. In Jesus' precious and mighty name I pray. Amen. Today we're looking at Colossians, the third chapter, and we are probably going to be in a two-part series here, but we're looking at verses 1 through 15, and my guess is it'll take us at least two weeks to cover all those verses. But as we get into it, let's read the, uh, the passage of Scripture, which is verses 1 through 15 of the third chapter of Colossians. So if you have found it, that's great. And if not, I'll give you a few more minutes. And uh, it's over there near Ephesians and Thessalonians and in, in that area. So uh, Colossians, Paul's letter to the Christians at Colossae. Chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ... Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, which are fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is adultery. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which he also walked sometime, when ye lived in them. But now 
ye also put off all these anger wrath malice blasphemy filthy communication out of your mouth lie not one to another seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him where there is neither greek nor jew circumcision nor uncircumcision barbarian scythian bond nor free but christ is all and in all put on therefore as the elect of god holy and beloved bowels of mercies kindness humbleness of mind meekness long-suffering forbearing one another and forgiving one another if any man have a quarrel against any even as christ forgave you so also do ye and above all these things put on charity which is the bond of perfection and let the peace of god rule in your hearts to the which also ye are called in one body and be ye thankful be ye thankful and let the peace of god rule in your hearts to the which also you're called in one body and be ye thankful reading verse 15 again and let the peace of god rule in your hearts to the which also ye are called in one body and be ye thankful we are thankful for the only hope we have which is jesus christ god so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son jesus was in heaven with the father and he left the glory of heaven to come down and be born of a virgin to live a life where he was faced with every temptation that we will ever be faced with and yet he lived without sin he lived a perfect life living that perfection of a life he was yet accused falsely put through a mockery of a trial and sentenced wrongly to the cruel cross at calvary to be crucified he laid down his life for me and you he died for every person in the world past present and future that each of us would have the opportunity to accept him as our lord and savior and to ask him to forgive us of our sins and he has already paid the price for those sins so as we invite him into our heart he chooses to come in and then the holy spirit baptizes us into the body of christ and seals us for everlasting time that's possible only because jesus left heaven to come down to pay the price for the sins of each and every person aren't we thankful for jesus listen to our friend guy Cosi as he sings and you'll be blessed Suppose God searched through heaven, He couldn't find one willing to be a supreme sacrifice that was needed. That would buy eternal life for you and me. Had it not been for a place called Mount Calvary.
As we go into the lesson now, this lesson is addressing believers, followers of Jesus Christ, born-again believers. The lesson applies to those who are not believing from the standpoint of anything else, but it stands for those who believe and follow Jesus Christ. First things first. So before we get into all of this applying, the first thing is to make sure that he's talking to me, he's talking to you. And he is if we are followers of Christ, if we have been born again, he's talking to us. Paul is, but God's speaking through the Holy Spirit's anointing of the words that Paul wrote in the letters to the Christians at Colossae. They're also to us. The most important decision each of us makes while we're living on this earth is to accept Jesus Christ as the Son of God, repenting of our sins, asking His forgiveness, and receiving Him in our hearts as our Lord. He is our Savior. One does not have to decide not to accept him. As a person is condemned already when realizing there is a decision to be made. John three seventeen. He didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world was already condemned and he came to bring life. If you have not accepted Jesus as your Lord, contact me or another Christian to discuss it. Any pastor or deacon or any church leader or any other Christian, I'm sure, would be glad to talk with you about salvation. My phone number is listed in the directory for Carabelle, Florida, and I'm on Facebook and have a private messenger so you can do all of those or email me and the email is located on Facebook as well. 
Now, once one is saved, these verses that we read apply to us as born-again Christians. Let's look at verse 1. Verse 1 says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. What Paul is saying is that we do not need to fool ourselves. This is not for game playing. If is an evaluation for us. If we have been risen with Christ, if we're saved, if we have been born again and resurrected from that old dead nature into a new nature which is in Christ, if that's where we are, if we're followers of Christ, then these things that we're about to study apply. And if we're born again, Jesus is our Lord. Now, that being the case, I am born again. The Bible says we are to seek or to pursue or go after those things that are above. So what are those things above? Things that are everlasting. Things that are heavenly. Some examples would be love, forgiveness, spirituality, things that are pure, mercy, kindness, humility meekness, patience. Love covers all of these as it embraces all of these qualities. Which of these qualities did God not exercise toward me when he allowed me to be accepted by Jesus Christ as one of his? Which quality did he apply each and every one of those that we just talked about or mentioned? He doesn't expect of us anything that he hasn't already done himself. When he expects us to be forgiving, we can know that he knows what he's talking about because he has forgiven. He has forgiven us. What less can we do for him than to forgive others since that's our hope that he has forgiven us? When we get our goals set, the things we desire are those things above. We seek to be like Jesus, who is seated at the right hand of God and is God in the triune God. Triune Jesus, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So we know Christ is seated in the right hand of God in heaven, righteous. And our desire is for him to work through the Holy Spirit through us to make us more and more and more like Jesus. In order for us to accomplish that or for, to allow the Holy Spirit to work through us to accomplish it, verse 2 says, Set your affection on things above not on things on earth. A practical thing that comes to my mind when I, as I just read that is we want to be like Jesus more than we want to be like an outstanding quarterback or an outstanding basketball player or an outstanding fisherman or an outstanding anything. Our goal, number one, is to set our affection what we really want to be like, what we really want to accomplish, are those things that are eternal, not those things on earth. Jesus is eternal. We want to be like Jesus. So have your desires been on those things above, not on those things in this world? Because those things on, in this world are temporary. They do not last. As followers of Christ, each of us has died with him to this world. Think about this. 
when God took upon us, we are hid in Christ. As if we were dead in our life on earth, God sees us in his future perfect vision. He sees us as we will be like Jesus. Now that, bear with me here, and I think we'll, I think the explanation comes to that. But you think about it. Jesus is in God, and God is in Jesus. And we're in Jesus, and Jesus is in us. And we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. When God looks down upon Mike, praise God, he sees Jesus. And he sees me in the righteousness of Jesus. Now, God sees things that we're not capable of seeing yet. We're not there. And when he sees with his future perfect vision, he sees us as we will be when we have become exactly like Christ. Isn't that wonderful? Now, in the meantime, Jesus deals with us. He chastises those he loves. But God sees Jesus' righteousness. So we owe a tremendous debt of gratitude to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our battle daily is with our old nature. That nature that is dead to God, but he's alive to us yet because he keeps trying to lay, raise his old ugly head. So every day we battle that old nature. We die daily. And there's scripture in Luke about that. So it, it does not wish to give up. That old nature doesn't want to give up. And it raises its head quite often. We are to get up each day and crucify over the old nature of sin. So one of the first things we need to do, maybe even before we get out of bed, is to crucify all over again that old nature, reminding ourselves that we belong to Jesus and that our goal for the day is to be like him. The Bible says, take up your cross daily. What do you think that means? It means we die to self every day. What does that mean? It means that not our will, but God's will be done each day. And uh, I'll just throw in here, there are times in my working career where I would just feel overwhelmed with so many things to do and deadlines coming fast, faster than I could imagine getting anything done. And I'd get awfully frustrated until I went to the Lord and I pray a prayer something like, Lord, you know my situation. Help me to do today what you want me to do. And that just seemed to make me feel so much better about the demands. But now I had to pay that, pray that, <laughs> I had to pray that prayer more than one time, I'll confess. Because, again, that old nature wants to come back up there. So we need to set our goals on those things that are above, those heavenly things, those traits of Jesus. In verse 4, it says, When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. What a blessed hope we have that when Christ comes to get his church, we're going to leave this earth and we're going to meet him in the air and forevermore be with Christ, his bride. This verse describes our daily lives here with our Lord Jesus Christ. Our reward is in this verse. The reward is when Christ appears, we will also appear with him. Think about that mighty army of God that's coming back where the battle of Armageddon and all that's going on, the ultimate victory, victory in Jesus. We're going to be with Jesus, a mighty army. We'll also appear with him as part of that powerful, victorious army of Christ. 
going on to verse 5, it talks about mortify. That's put to death. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Now, when I first read that a long time ago, I thought, well, what's he talking about? Members on earth. Well, he goes right on to tell us. So the Bible always explains itself if we're just led by the Spirit enough to, to figure it out, I guess, or to hear what's being said. So, so what are you saying now? We're going to appear with Christ. We're in Christ in this earth, and we need to set our affections upon those above and when Christ comes back, we will appear with him. So, Paul says, Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon earth. So, those things that are earthly are temporary. Those things that are earthly do not measure up to those things that are heavenly, that are on high. So, we are to kill again. We are to make sure they're dead. We have to put them to death every day sometimes, and sometimes more than that. We're to put to death, to death. We are to defeat. And what is it that we're to defeat? Those things that are worldly. Now, he lists them. Fornication is one. Illicit sex sex outside marriage now that that hits today now i'm not i i don't point fingers necessarily but uh sex outside of marriage just seems to be something that people play with nowadays and i must tell you that's not what the bible says do now it's not the unpardonable sin and we know that so there's hope but to have that as a value above being like Christ, we need to put that to death daily. Fornication. Another one is uncleanness. That's it. Any sin, any disobedience. When we're disobedient to what the teachings of Jesus are, that is uncleanness. There's a song I love, and it's based on David's uh, confession and prayer to God. I think it's the 51st Psalm. But it's cleanse me, search me, and cleanse me. And it talks about hyssop and, and the cleaning. And, you know, when I, I remember this, and maybe you do for your own experience, but when I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior, which was in my bedroom, and then again when I marched down the aisle at the church the next time I was in church, to let all my people at church know what in the world I've done and what Jesus has done for me, I don't know that I've ever felt any more clean than I did right then. And I can't even describe it, except I still vividly in my mind know how clean that I felt. And it's because I was washed in the blood of the Lamb. So, uncleanness. We need to desire to be like Jesus on high than to be disobedient like the people of the world are. Inordinate affection. What do you think that's talking about? Inordinate affection. In, in uh, some of the scriptures that I've studied over recent months, it talks about people just dreaming up things to do bad because what they've been doing is just so natural and they won't be unnatural. And uh, I think if you look around the world today, you might see some of that as well, probably a lot of it. And the Bible clearly says that's not right. That's sin. That's disobedience. That's worldly. That's not setting our affections on things are, that are above. In order and affection is not above, it's right down here in the gutter of the earth in the world. God provides obvious objects of our affection. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out. And we are to stay away from any affection 
that's aimed at any other direction than what God has presented to. So after inordinate affections, the hearts with our senses, usually our eyes, but it doesn't stop there. And that is what we need to do to prevent evil thoughts. We pray, lead us not into temptation. And that's a good thing to pray for. We will be tempted. And I know I've used this before, but it always fits with me to a good reminder. Uh, Brother Vance Parks, a, a preacher that uh, was a shrimper, who came here, loved Care Bell. And he said one time, he said, you know, you can't help but the bird flying over your head, but you can prevent him from building a nest on your head. So we need to not let a bird build a nest on our head. When the temptation comes, we need to get past it and not dwell on evil thoughts. And we'll be happier for that. Another one is covetousness. Covetousness is when we actually want something that belongs to somebody else. We get jealous because we see something that somebody else has, and not only do we want one like it, we want it. And I'm telling you, the devil can put those desires in your mind and in your being that you want you want what they've got. And obviously, that can go to uh, spouse for that matter. But we don't need to let that go past the flying over the head stage. So covetousness is actually idolatry. It's overly desiring something that belongs to another. Not one like it, but I want it. And that's dangerous. You ever thought about idolatry? An idol it's what you make of what you want that belongs to that other person. And those are the examples of earthly members that we have. Earthly goals, earthly drawings, earthly objects. And those are the things that the Bible says we need to mortify. We need to put those things to death. These things listed in verse 5 are the reasons for the wrath of God and that the wrath of God comes on children who are sinful, disobedient. When we wonder why suffering is happening, we should at least consider this as one of the possibilities. Now, it's not always the case. It rains on the just and the unjust. But for our growth sake, Christian growth sake, when we're suffering, we need to examine ourselves to see if we have been disobedient and perhaps God is trying to get our attention. So these things that we listed would be a good list to check if things are going wrong and things are uphill all the time and we've all been there it's not always because of a sin but we personally need to examine ourselves to see if perhaps it is now i didn't say examine somebody else this is about personal remember this scripture is written to save people it's written to people who are in Christ. So, we need to be taking this very serious, and I, I know you are. Verse 7 reads this way, Into which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. So what that is reminding us of is when we see people suffering, we don't need to come down on them and say it's because of what they've done. We don't need to think that we're anything special above what they are because whatever they've done, we've probably been guilty of ourselves. Jesus forgives us and he wants us to start afresh every day, every moment. 
with the desire to be like him. We're reminded that we have been like those that we see who are living worldly. We now need to remind ourselves that we have been put to death in Christ Jesus to those old that old nature, that those old members, those old practices. And we need to turn from those things of the world and live victoriously in our lives in Christ. I'm reminded when we look at the world and when we're trying to witness or live in a way that would uh, invite others to come to know Jesus, so many times we can be tempted to think that somebody's just way beyond hope. That the lifestyle that they live and the attitude they have it's just no way that they could come to know the Lord. Then, I think the Holy Spirit reminds me of my history. And there I was. You know, no matter how good you might act like you are or think you are, without Christ, the Bible makes reference to as filthy rags. We're not able, we don't have the ability to conjure up enough righteousness to count for anything. So we can't look down at anybody else and say they're beyond hope because if we've accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, no one was any more lost than we were before we came to know Jesus. We're either in Jesus or not in Jesus. There's no in between. But the wonderful gift of eternal life or everlasting life that we get when we are in Jesus gives us a hope that no one else has. It's a hope to go home to our heavenly home. What a beautiful and sweet place that's going to be where all of our desires will be met because all of our desires would be controlled and led by God himself. And what a wonderful time to look toward and everybody there is going to be brothers and sisters and love each other. No wonder they call it, refer to it often as Sweet Beulah Land. A perfect place that we're going to that's being prepared for us. And it could happen any day that the Lord decides to come back, that God decides to send Jesus back for his own. It's important to be one of his own. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, there's no better time than now. Commit your life to Him. Ask Him to forgive you, acknowledging that He is the Son of God. And He paid the price for all of our sins and all of your sins. And invite Him into your heart. And then I'd say, find another Christian. You can get in touch with me. But follow through in a way of making a public profession. But salvation doesn't have to wait. You can do that right now, wherever you are. I was saved in my bedroom. Now, I heard a lot of sermons that caused me some concern because I did not want to die and go to a devil's hell. It wasn't prepared for us, but that's where we're headed if we don't know Jesus as our Lord and Savior. But I'm thankful to the Lord that I am in Him now, as wretched as I was, as sinful as I can do, be nowadays. I'm in Him because of what He's done, not because of what I've done. And because of what He's done, I look forward to sweet Beulah land. Guy Causey, a good friend from Alabama, and Brother Milton and, and Miss Virginia French's son-in-law. His wife is Terry, who is their daughter. So, guy's got a beautiful voice. Listen and be blessed as he sings Sweet Beulah Land.
I've never been before. No sad goodbyes will there be spoken, and time won't matter. And someday on thee I'll stand there my home will be eternal. Just a few, a few more days to labor, and then I'll take my heavenly flight. Hope you. Someday on thee I'll stand. There my home will be eternal. What a beautiful song, and uh, I just I just think all kind of good things when I think about Sweet Beulah Land. Listen to that song, so we can be practicing being in Sweet Beulah Land by letting the peace of God reign in our hearts. We'll close here now, and next week we'll begin with verse eight and go from there. Thank you so much for participating with us in this study. May God bless you. And I look forward to being with you again next week as we continue this study on the peace of God reigning in our hearts.